I'd like to start us off with a reading from Sacred Scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Okay, this reading is a reading from Psalms, the book of the Psalms. And it is Psalm 145. Psalm 145. It goes like this. The title of it is The Greatness and Goodness of God. I will praise, O David. I will extol you, my God and King. I will bless your name forever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever. Great is the Lord and worthy of high praise. God's grandeur is beyond understanding. One generation praises your deeds to the next and proclaims your mighty works. They speak of the splendor of your majestic glory, tell of your wonderful deeds. They speak of your fearsome power and attest to your great deeds. They publish the renown of your abounding goodness and joyfully sing of your justice. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love. The Lord is good to all, compassionate to every creature. All your works give you thanks, O Lord, and your faithful bless you. They speak of the glory of your reign and tell of your great works, making known to all your power the glorious splendor of your rule. Your reign is a reign for all ages, your dominion for all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in every word and faithful in every work. The Lord supports all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look hopefully to you. You give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You, Lord, are just in all your ways, faithful in all your works. You, Lord, are near to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you in truth. You satisfy the desire of those who fear you. You hear their cry and save them. You, Lord, watch over all who love you, but all the wicked you destroy. My mouth will speak your praises, Lord. All flesh will bless your holy name forever. The significant aspect, of course, the, the whole psalm is significant, but in relationship to generations, it's very clear in here when it says one generation praises your deeds to the next, that has to be transferred in some way to the next generation so that the faith continues to be spreading in the family line <clears throat> in the, in the, from generation to generation. And so what we're about here, of course, is healing the family tree, which means that we have to address to the best of our ability the flaws that existed in our family, the difficulties that were encountered, and how our ancestors overcame those difficulties. Because it says your reign is a reign for all ages, your dominion for all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in every word and faithful in every work. And so again, the whole understanding of generations is very, very important in all the dimensions of sacred scripture. But how are people to learn this? How are people to learn anything about the Bible, about scripture, about the sacraments, about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father? This is something that doesn't come automatically when you're born. It's not an instinct. It's something that needs to be carefully taught. And blessed are those, I say, those who receive the message from those before them and are prepared to carry it forth from them to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And that's basically what this is saying, the psalm. And so we, we come to understand basically that, of course, we're all sinners. You know, there, there's no doubt about that. Uh, none of us are uh, perfect, 
Our families are not perfect. And so knowing that, knowing that our families are not perfect, where are the imperfections? <clears throat> Do we know what those imperfections were or are in the present, past and present? But another thing that we need to ask ourselves, were there any secrets in our families? Things that were hidden out of shame, out of doubt, out of conflict, out of interruption of emotions? How far back can we go in knowing our ancestry? And again, as I mentioned before, there are so many people nowadays are interested in ancestry, ancestry.com. And they want somebody, they're going to pay somebody to research to see where their families came from, the origin, where they came from and how they got here. And so the reason why that is, is because people don't know. They have to get somebody outside to do the work they can't do. Now, for my own example, I know some of the history of my family through my grandmother. She told the stories. There were people in my family and, and my Aunt Angie, you know, they were the key people in telling us the story of coming to America, of family strengths and family weaknesses. And the flaws, even the flaws. Like my Aunt Angie once told me when I was visiting her in Philadelphia, she said, my father's name was Sam, and she affectionately called him Sammy. Sammy had a rough time. Well, what does that mean? You know? I want to know what that rough time was. I want to know all about it. And what I wasn't thinking of then that I'm thinking of now, if he had it rough, what impact does that have on me? And we say this about any of our parents. Because my father, again, I, I probably mentioned this before, um, went through the Depression, he went through World War II, uh, breakup of the family, his, mo his mother died when he was three, <clears throat> and so with the family there was a split uh, because uh, some didn't like the stepmother, some did, and so the thing was there was a division in the family, some uh, stayed Roman Catholic, and the others uh, became Assembly of God. Now that Assembly of God came through a man that was already Assembly of God, my uncle, my uncle Harry, yeah, and my Aunt Connie. Okay, They were Assembly of God. But in the midst of all that, I have to say, my Aunt Connie, even though she was Assembly of God, I'm not apologizing for that, was the most spiritual woman in the whole family. And she told me some things too. She was so spiritual. I admired her so much. She loved me and I loved her. Her faith was strong. And my Uncle Harry loved to talk about faith. He was, he was a natural preacher. Maybe I got some of that from him. I, I don't know. because I don't know if I'm a natural preacher or not. But I'm trained to be. Went to seminary and got trained. Homiletics. Homiletics. It was all a very positive experience. Except the homiletics guy for homiletics one told me and Father Robert, a good friend of mine, uh, you have a Philadelphia slur. <laughs> you know, and, and that was like kind of insulting, you know, um, because he had the perfect Midwestern accent. Ha 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 for him. And so the thing was, when I listened to myself on these recordings, on the videos, right? Oh, I still got that Philadelphia slur. I never got rid of it. Just like you from the South have the, have the Southern accent, you all. <laughs> not you guys, you all. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no criticism with this. Okay? And so this is kind of an idea that when you think about your families, it's really fascinating what your family was like, your brothers and your sisters. Who looks like who? Who doesn't look like who? Who looks like your dad? Who looks like your mom? You know, the genetics of everything, which we know a lot more about now because of God's giving us intelligence to delve into the mysteries of existence and life and science and philosophy and theology. Thinking, thinking, 
but also feeling, you know? And it's even like when we studied the atheists in seminary, okay? They were all about thinking. They were thinkers. There's no doubt about that. I was always curious about what their feelings were like, you know? Well, how did they become atheists? How come they didn't believe? Was it something in the family? Was it something previous in their family before them, grandparents and so on? But we can say that about anybody, not even, you know, not just atheists, but, but those of us who are strong in faith and belief in Jesus Christ. What were the feelings that were attached when we were learning that? What were my feelings in Catholic school when I was growing up? Besides fear, <laughs> and the sisters, and they were good teachers, good teachers, but my feelings were, I felt a lot. Because, see, I'm a, I'm a feeling person. I have to admit that. I'm a feeling person. i got to watch it, because sometimes I, I act before I think. But that doesn't mean I'm dumb. You know, because I'm a feeling person, I'm also, uh, I'm also, you know, a, a thinker, but that's not my primary core, okay? Because, I mean, I, 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 I studied a lot, you know? When I was in seminary, I might have mentioned this before, I read everything they gave me. Every single word. And, and some of the other guys were like, well, tell me what it was all about, man. I ain't got time to read, to read that stuff, <laughs> you know? And, goes, and there were guys, you know, who were tremendous prayers. You know, I remember one time I went into um, the chapel, okay, and I wanted to say some prayers, right? Well, there was this guy in there, his name was Russ, and he was in there, and he was deep in prayer, very deep. And it was so quiet in there, you know? And I, I was kind of praying, but I was thinking about the lesson the next day. I had to get that out of my mind, you know? So I had to calm myself. Because of the feelings, you know, the feelings. But I'll never forget Russ. And he became a missionary to Japan. You know. uh, very, very holy guy. Very, very holy guy. So anyway, so, so the thing is, when we think about the feelings that we deal with, okay, the power of them. Like, say for, say for example, in my, in my own family, um, my mother, her feelings were all over the place. She had so many feelings. She didn't never, never met a stranger. She loved everybody, you know. Now my dad was a different story. He was a thinker. He was a definite thinker. I never near, knew really exactly what he was feeling, and that kind of made it rough on my mother too, because she kind of had to draw it out of him, you know. So they were complementary in a way, but the interesting thing about it is I take after my mother. In terms of feelings. My brother, who's three years younger than me, he takes after my father. He was a thinker, he's a thinker. You know? I have trouble understanding or knowing what he's feeling, you know? And and so the thing is, how does that happen? You know. What was transferred to us, not only verbally, but non-verbally, in terms of how we all became who we are, miraculously made in the image and likeness of God. Whoa, that's a pretty heavy thing, being a sinner at the same time. <laughs> but this is something we recognize. We're not perfect, okay? We're not perfect. We have temptations, and we dealt with this in the discerning of spirits when we did that class, okay? So I kind of want to go on today and mention what's called the primary vehicle for healing is through healing masses. Healing masses. The mass, the holy sacrifice of the mass is healing. It's about healing. About praise and about other things. Hearing the words of Jesus. Reading the scriptures. But there's something about the mass that's supernatural. There's something about it where when we offer our petitions, we, we offer them for our family members who are sick. Our sick grandma, our sick aunt, our own sicknesses. We want to be healed. The Mass gives us sanctifying grace. It sanctifies us. It gives us a sense of closeness to Jesus intimately. 
in his body, blood, soul, and divinity in remembrance of him, what Jesus told us. Now, any Christian denomination has a healing dimension. It's inescapable because it's all in the scripture. It's all in the Bible, the healing. There are, are, there are genuine healers in all Christian denominations, Catholic, Protestant. And so the recognition of, of this ability to heal, to pray deeply, that's an experience of healing. Now, there are some, you know, who are fake healers. We all know that, you know. I mean, they were kind of putting on a show, and they had somebody playing it out in the audience, you know, who wasn't sick at all, and probably was in a wheelchair on crutches, and they were perfectly healthy. And so the guy says, you know, brings them up there, and they're, you know, and all of a sudden they're healed, they're jumping around, stuff like that, you know. So some of it's fake, you know. But even the questions need to be asked about that. What did they learn in their faith? What did they learn in their Christian faith where were they led astray in terms of being manipulative and taking advantage of people? Could it be maybe they lost their faith? Could it be that their conscience was not there to tell them, this is wrong, this is, this is a lie. And whenever we think about lies, we have to think about the prince of lies, which is the devil, who exists and has his wily ways. Every morning I say the prayer... So St. Michael and my guarding angel. And in the evening, St. Michael, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, to cast into cell Satan and all the evil spirits that roam through the world seeking the ruin of souls. And there's also something in Scripture which is very important in the Bible. It says, do not go to bed angry. Do not go to bed angry. Don't give the devil a chance to work on you. Man, that's pretty profound. It's in the divine office, which we as priests and, and religious, you know, recite. Anybody can do the liturgy of the hours, you know, or, or, the, or the divine office. Um, but it's there. The scriptures, okay? So we take a look at this. The healing of generations. Generational issues can be found in many different areas. And so I'm going to list some of the areas where there is this need for healing. The generational issues. We oftentimes hear someone say about somebody else, they got a lot of issues, and I don't want to get involved. You know? And some people want to help, you know, they're dealing with a very difficult issue. I think maybe I'll see if they want to talk about it. You know, everybody's different in terms of their personality and affect, whether the thinkers or feelers. Intuitive or perceptives or judging, all the manifestations of all the possible combinations in terms of making up human personality, which is 32 different combinations. It's amazing. We're all different. But at the same time, we're all the same, too. That's the enigma of the human being, the human person. This humanity that rose from somewhere, Adam and Eve. What does Genesis tell us? Where did Genesis come from? It's divinely inspired. It tells us something about being fallen. And that's what we are. We needed to be redeemed. We needed to be saved. And so Jesus Christ, the new Adam, came in order that we can have entrance into the gates of heaven which were opened by Jesus Christ. And everybody else that was waiting to get in there, oh, I can't wait to go there. You know, because <laughs> you know, there was this sense in this, this uh, Hebrew concept of Sheol, which was the waiting. The gates of heaven were closed. And so everybody's waiting. And the prophet Samuel, you know, uh, Moses, all the different people there were all like, you know, waiting, waiting for those gates to open up. It's a magnificent thing. It's supernatural. Supernatural. Now, supernatural is an interesting word. Did we learn about supernatural? Does that, was that word taught to us? Do we know what that is? Supernatural? When I was in seminary, they, uh, I think it was uh, the uh, theologian Karl Rahner, okay? Not the comedian guy. This is, this is a theologian. I think the other, what was the other guy? Comedian. Um, I don't know, but anyway. Karl Rahner, okay? And he coined this phrase, the exist. The, the supernatural existential. I never heard of that before. I heard of supernatural. And I knew 
existentialism was a philosophy of the modern era, so to speak, of modernism, which the church had to keep in check because of the thinking, all the thinking that was going, all the doubts that were arising for some reason or other by human ability to question and wanting answers, demanding answers. Sometimes we demand answers. I want an answer to this. Why? And so this supernatural existential <clears throat> was some way, it was a way of explaining that in recognition of the supernatural, that which is grace, which, build on, which builds on nature, so grace is supernatural, it's amazing, supernatural grace. Okay? And so the thing is, the supernatural existential was, how do we deal with spirituality, prayer, and everything Christian in the modern world? Existential. Human existence. If a person's existing, what they believe or not, how they were taught or not, we exist. Existing. And that existence came gradually from the very beginning, conception of birth, the human being, the human person, given life by God, and in the very depths and heart and soul of a woman, and the man standing there beside oh, the woman. And so, so this sense of existential. How do we deal with our existence? That's basically what it was all about, all of these philosophers. How do we deal with our existence? What do we think about? It? What are our philosophies? Everybody here, everybody, every human being has some kind of a philosophy. They believe something about themselves and others and what is beyond, the great beyond. Great beyond. Well, this is just a little aside, but um, just recently, a, a couple of months ago, I um, discovered that uh, Star Trek, the original series, was back on again. Now, I'm not a Trekkie, really. I can't say I'm not formally a Trekkie fanatic, but but it seems like in that show there was always a message about humanity. There was always a message about what's beyond, what is out there. Are there people out there like us? But everything that in that show that they portrayed about those others out there, these aliens or these people on other planets, they were really saying something about us in them. It's really kind of a magnificent thing, you know, in terms of what that show was all about. The original was the best. I, I, I'm not too crazy about, you know, Space Nine and you know, whatever the other ones were afterwards. But anyway, okay, so now... <clears throat> To get back on track, the generational issues, okay? Addictions, addictions, alcohol, drugs, food, being addicted. When we're addicted to something, that not only affects us, it affects the whole family. The whole family. And sometimes there's a secret. I'll give you an example from my own family. My grandfather on my mother's side, her father, he was an Irishman, 100%. And I hear the story that he used to make root beer down in the cellar near the coal bin. Root beer? <laughs> yeah. And there was this, it, it was never really brought out. It was never really brought out. But it, it was like, is it a secret? Was there really alcohol down there? Nobody would talk about it. It was suspected that that was the case. How did that affect his family? Very interesting. And so anyway, that's just an example. But drug addiction, alcohol <clears throat> has always been an addictive problem down through the centuries. Okay. And, uh, and so, and so you know, even, even Noah got drunk, <laughs> you know? So I think, you know, and, and this thing is <clears throat> the whole sense of this, the drug era, you know? Uh, like say, for example, the, the 60s with, with, with the, um, you know, just uh, free love and all this. Don't, don't make war, make love and, <clears throat> and, you know, LSD. You're going on a trip, good or bad. And, 
all kinds of little drugs that sort of popped up heroin, you know, um, marijuana, uh, 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 cocaine, you know, all stuff like that. It, it was like of that generation. It seems like there was a proliferation of it. Now, there were some good, some good things about that time. But this whole thing about free love, the whole thing about drugs. I want. I had a great trip. Say, no, I didn't. I didn't. But I, somebody would say. <laughs> somebody would say. I had a great trip, man. LSD, man. It was cool. Man, I was floating around, man. I was really groovy. I, I felt so fine. I just like was floating around. I just was like seeing sights I never saw before. Man, I was flying. I was flying. My feet were off the ground. I was like, whoa. I'm out there, baby. I'm out there, you know. And then the, the other thing, if somebody had a bad trip, was like, oh my God, the devil was there. He was, he was trying to stick me with that forklift. I mean, what do you call it? Pitchfork. <laughs> you know? He was, <clears throat> he was bothering me. He was chasing me, man. I, I was like going crazy. I it was like, I was so afraid. And then, then when I came out of it, man, I was funky. I, I, just, I was totally wasted, man. You know, so anyway, this is an example. I'm not getting carried away. But anyway, <clears throat> okay. Now, food. Okay, food. <laughs> That's kind of an addiction. <laughs> you know? Sweet chocolate. Oh, man. Barbecue. Steak. Chicken. You know, it's like, you know, all the different things. Because what does food do for us? It makes us feel good. It makes us feel good. That's what food does. Of course, it keeps us alive too. You know, and we need to eat balanced meals, you know, and everything. You know, and they, they teach us how to do that. You know, eat your vegetables every day. Let's say, for example, uh, when I was growing up, um, we had peas. I hate peas. You know, and so my mother had peas there. Okay, <clears throat> and so anyway, <clears throat> so my mother's brother's like fooling around with his. You know, <clears throat> I don't know whether he like peas or not. I hated peas. I didn't want to eat them, you know. So my mom said, how come you aren't eating your peas? I don't like them, Ma. They're good for you. How many times have you heard that? It's good for you. I don't want, well, you're not getting up from that table until you eat your peas. You know? <laughs> no dessert, no nothing. You know, you can't go out and play. You know, all kinds of restrictions in terms of, you know, do what's good for you, whether you like it or not. Well, that's kind of rough when you like a nice big piece of apple pie or an eclair, you know, or a lot of that greasy, wonderful barbecue, you know, with, with, because fat and sugar, we taste that stuff. If you eat a dry piece of chicken, that would do nothing for you. Now, it nourishes you, of course, but there is a tendency in our society, because we're so affluent, that we can eat as much as we want, for the most part, okay? So food can be an addiction too. And of course they say in terms of, you know, food, eating too much food, um, is that it's trying to fill in something inside of ourselves that's empty. You know. It's a way of loving ourselves to feel good. Dealing with moods, dealing with depression, anxiety, all kinds of manifestations of mentalities and afflictions that come upon people for, for some reason. And it seems to be genetic, too. Like if someone in your family, at least your mom and your dad, was very depressed, okay? The siblings, the children. Is that going to be transferred to one of the kids? They say genetically it will, or, or could, okay? How much of it is learned and all that is, you know, uh, what's it called? Nature or nurture. There's, there's still that conflict. How much is, you know, nature, genetically, or how much is nurture? It's the way you were raised. Okay? There's still a controversy. That has not been settled. And so anyway, addiction. Now, another really important one in terms of healing, okay, the family tree, divorce. That's a tough one. Divorce. Who's a tough one? Well, everybody. But what does that do to the kids? Mom and dad don't love each other anymore. Mom and dad are fighting all the time. Daddy beats up mommy. Daddy's drunk. Get out of the way. Crawl into your bed. Yeah. Or, or mom, mommy is, is she, she always seems to be so sad. You know? How are the kids going to figure this out? 
Where did it come from? What about the grandparents and the great-great-grandparents? Those who came before them. How does it get transferred? The good, the bad, and the ugly. How does it get transferred? And so we have this sense of divorce. Can anybody love anyone? If a child may say, well, if my parents didn't love each other, who do I love? Is it even worth it? So I might as well go look, say for example, go look for a girl that I can live with where we ain't going to marry. Because then if we don't love each other anymore, we don't have to go through all that divorce crap. Oh, shoot. Stuff. Divorce stuff. You know? And so what is the thinking that goes on here? But it's not just the thinking, trying to figure things out. It's also about the feelings that sometimes are explosive. Or, or pushing down those feelings, as they say, of keeping the secret. How long can a family keep a secret? Like incest. It's a horrible thing to even think about. Incest. You know, it's, it's damaging. It's hurtful. Incest. Why? Sexual abuse. Why does anybody abuse anybody? Little kids. The whole big thing in the Catholic Church now is pedophile priests. Those priests who violated young people. Why? Why is that? How does that happen? What happened to that priest and his family? How does that explain that kind of behavior? But this is not something that just the Catholic Church deals with. The Baptist Church deals with that. The Episcopalian Church deals with that. The Church of Christ, they deal with that. All Christian denominations Everything, I mean, family, society, it's there. And it needs to be addressed. And so we go through these things in terms of scandals and, and, and hurtfulness. And, and where does that come from? How does that happen? We, 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 no man is an island. No man or woman is an island. Okay? And so, again, divorce is very, 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 very touchy. You know, oh, mom and dad, they, they don't live together anymore, and they don't love each other, but they're friends. What does that teach the kid? What is love? Does friendship involve love in some way or not? These are all things that people deal with every day. I've seen it. For 35 years, I've seen so much. I've seen so much suffering. But at the same time, so much joy. It's a whole world that opened up to me. If I would have stayed in the warehouse working in the factory, I wouldn't know very much. I probably would have married my girlfriend because I came close to doing that. The girl that I loved. But there was something more. I wanted more out of life. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to think more. I wanted to feel more to the depth of my soul. Thank God. My grandparents were solid Christians. Thank God. My parents were solid Christians. Thank God for the sisters and the priests. The foundation was laid. The Lord called me. And I went. And so for each one of us, what, what called us to marry? You married someone. You loved them. But sometimes things go wrong. And when those things go wrong, that's a wound. That needs to be healed. And I saw that when I was working in Retrovo, which is a marriage program for troubled marriages. And the big question about that ministry and those people who came to Retrovo was the question, can we, can we get together again? Can we rediscover that love that for some reason went away? Can we, can we get back together again? Can we solve our problems? Can we deal with those things that are part of our family that's been given to us? How do we deal with that? It was a magnificent thing to see a couple who had a troubled marriage and they came back together and their marriage 
was more beautiful than before. Those people were the people that entered, some of them, entered into the ministry of Retrovi, and they told their story. Their story was no longer a secret. They were willing to tell that story to those people out there to say, there is hope. There is the possibility. Nothing is impossible with God. What does it mean to love? Is it just a feeling? No, it's not just a feeling. It's a decision. You decide to love. That's what it means in the scriptures. Jesus decided to love. Maybe he didn't have the feelings, you know, when Peter got rambunctious, you know, and, or, or when the apostles were like, you know, I don't understand what he's talking about. You know, and so, but we still find the charism. We're, this man's saying something. We're following him because he's saying something that nobody else said before. And then, like I talked in, in my little homily today about the, the Apostle John. His characteristics and personality were very different from all the other apostles. And so we find that there are some people that hold us together. Like, who is the anchor of your family? Who is the anchor of my family? Well, the anchor was my mother. And my father was the strength. We are families, when you think about it. Who was the anchor? Who was the anchor? Who was the strength? Did you have that? Or not? Okay, now there's another aspect that comes into this, you know, generational issues. And... The other one is adoption. When a child is adopted, for some reason, a woman has a child, obviously with a father, who may or may not be there, and she can't take care of that child. They can't take care of that baby. And so by the grace of God, the grace of God, she gives the child up for adoption. Again, an example from my own family. One of my cousins, she got pregnant, wasn't married, and she had this child, a girl, a little girl. And when my mother found that out, she wanted to adopt that child. She wanted a little girl. She already had two boys, so she needed to balance things out. She wanted that little girl. She was going to get that little girl home. But my aunt said no. It would cause too much tension. Too many strong feelings in the family. I can't let that happen. That's what my aunt said. I can't let that happen. So the child was given up for adoption. And so somewhere in this world, there's a little girl that I could have known. I could have had a little sister, but it never happened. That was the family. And how much of that was a secret for a period of time? It's amazing. Adoption. So when a child is adopted, depending on the, like, Father Pew. Father Pew was adopted. Thank God to a couple that loved him. Gave him a home. Taught him the faith. Father Odie Heimar, you know, Father Odell Heimer, he, he, was, he was adopted. Both, both St. Peter's orphanage kids, which is now gone. The orphanage is gone. And so they were blessed. But what about the kids that don't get that kind of love? What, is, what does that do to them? What have they learned? And then, and then there's um, foster, foster care. We'll love you for a certain period of time until somebody wants you. <laughs> what does that do emotionally to a child? What does that do to their thinking? And what's that going to do when they hand on the tradition, when they get married? Or, you know, when they have a vocation to the religious life or the priesthood or the ministry? What's that going to be like for them and those around them? Very interesting. Okay. Uh, we're kind of getting... Oh, no, never mind. Okay, here we go. 
The next one is sudden death. Sudden death. When somebody dies suddenly, what does that do to our thinking and feeling? No preparation. No saying goodbye. No saying I love you for the last time. No holding the hand of someone we love who's going to pass away. I was very blessed to hold my mother's hand when she died. That was a blessing. The last thing that happened was, I said, I said to her, Mom, if you need to go, don't worry. We're okay. I squeezed her hand very lightly. She squeezed back. That was the last sign of love from my mother. Now, unfortunately, I was not there when my father died because he died suddenly. My father died suddenly. That kind of threw me for a loop. And, and so it was tough because I came back home and I learned things about my father I didn't know before. I, w I was shocked. I was surprised. He told us some stories about the war and about growing up, but not, not very much, not very much. But there were people who came up to me and my mother and my brother and said, your father helped me when I was newly employed. When I was newly employed and was kind of needing someone to give me direction, your dad was there. And the interesting thing about it, at that time, there were young black engineers coming out of colleges. They were the ones that came up and said, your dad supported me and got me into a good position at the naval base. And there were others that thanked him too for, for his instruction, for his guidance, for caring for, about them. I never knew that. <laughs> my, mother, my mother never told me that. My father never told me that. It's amazing what we learn. You know, it's amazing what we learn. Sudden death. But in every instance, not too long after my mother and my father died, I had dreams about them. Dreams. Dreams are in the Bible. Angels. Dreams. They say something to us. And if we can remember them, maybe we can figure out what, they, what they're saying to us. That's a mysterious thing. We have dreams. Now, I know my mother's little dog, Monty, okay, uh, he would be asleep, and suddenly, when he was asleep, his little feet would be going, oh, oh. he was asleep. He, his little feet were going like this, and oh, oh, oh. he was dreaming. And so, dreams are very powerful for human beings, but when there is a sense of affection, a sense of loyalty in an animal, and in us, of course, we have to remember, human beings, human beings tamed the wolf. And so now we have Yorkies. <laughs> it's hard to imagine a Yorkie coming from a wolf, but, but they're our friends. They mean something to us. Like I, I had a cat, Gizmo. I loved Gizmo. Gizmo loved me. When she died, man, it broke me up. But we, we made them. We brought them from the wild, from the savagery of nature. And they taught us, we taught them to love us. But we teach each other to love each other. That's what, that's what Jesus was all about. And because he was all about that, People got upset with them because that upset the apple cart. I ain't going to love no sinner. They're condemned. Hey, why is that guy crippled? That's because his parents sinned. And so God getting on him. He's a sinner himself. He's part of that sinfulness. You know? The heartlessness, the coldness. Jesus broke that up. He saved people. He saved us. We believe in Jesus. He's, he's our Savior. He's given us new life. We're born again. We've received what is necessary for us to be truly called to a life in the Spirit. To the new life that will never end.
And so, again, you know, sudden death. There's another thing, too. Someone who dies alone. Someone who dies alone. Could be a man on the street, homeless man. Someone who dies alone. Do we want to die alone? Oh, probably not. Because there's something about dying when there are people who love us that are there. Something healing about that. We're healed. When someone, when someone dies, they need us. It's a blessing to have someone there who loves us. Who's going to say goodbye. Who's going to say, I love you. Now I had that opportunity with my mother. But I also, when I got on that plane to go back to Memphis, I told my father, I said, Dad, I love you. He said, I love you too, Mike. So I did, I did say that because not too long after he, he died in his sleep. That's the grace of God. Why does it happen that way? Is it random? Is it, does it just happen? Does anything just happen? Everything happens for a reason. There's no just it happened. And so, dying alone. The sacrament in the Catholic Church, the sacrament of, of the anointing, is saying goodbye. It's saying, you're healed, you're freed. The angel is coming to get you, to bring you to paradise. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. Then, then there's this. And this, this is kind of a tough one. This is the sixth one. There's 12, but anyway. Um, okay, the sixth one. Neglecting. Neglecting to pray for the deceased. Do we forget them? Do they no longer exist? What happens to them? Where do they go? And this is a controversy in Christianity. What happens after death? Do we pray for the dead? Do we need to pray for the dead? When we remember them, we're really praying for them. That's every Christian denomination. But in the Catholic faith, we pray because there may be some that are on their way to heaven. But they need to learn some things before they get there. And what they learn is from the teacher. Almighty God. And what prepares them? What purifies them? The fire, the fire of God's love purifies them. But they know they're on their way. They know they're going to get there. And so I would, I'd be willing to say, it is very hard to go to hell. It's very hard. You've got to be pretty nasty, unbelieving. You have to be really empty to go to hell. You have to be so full with sin that you've never been healed. You've never prayed with anyone. You never went to worship with fellow people in the faith. It's hard to go to hell. God is merciful. And if there's that inkling, that sense of, I need Jesus. I need to believe. I've not been a good person my whole life. But on my dying, dying bed, on my deathbed, God help me, save me. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The good thief. And what did Jesus say to him? This sinner on the cross for some crime? Jesus said to him, Today, today, you will be with me in paradise. So anybody can be saved. But it's very, very hard to go to hell. A person has to work at that. Believe it or not, it's kind of crazy, but you've got to work at going to hell. You know? And we use that as a curse, too. Ah, go to hell. 
To hell with you. you know? That's a pretty heavy thing to tell somebody that. You know. But anyway, that's that's that. Okay? So we pray for the deceased. Mary Canali today, a very, very strong Christian Catholic woman. Passed away sweetly, smoothly, painlessly. Do we need to pray for her? Is she in heaven? She deserves to go to heaven, obviously, yes. But we still pray for her. Because if she doesn't need those prayers, if she doesn't need those prayers, those prayers will go to somebody else who has no one to pray for them. And they're there. They're slowly making their way, but they need someone to say, I love you. I don't know who you are, but I love you. And I want you to get to heaven. I know you're on your way, but I'm going to help you speed up. That's the beauty of this. This whole thing. Another thing. And again, with any of these, it's all about how does, how does that affect the family? How does, it, how does it affect the way we were raised? The way we're going to raise others? All of this has an impact. This is all about the family. And so the last one that I'm going to do today is not dying in peace. Oh, that's got to be tough. When someone is not at peace when they die, what happens to them? If someone doesn't die in peace, that's not just their own issue. That becomes an issue for everybody in that family. That becomes an issue that they'll have to deal with. They didn't die in peace. No one said, I love you. No one said, I care. They were filled with fear, fear of death. Well, we all fear of death, obviously, sure. It's natural. But our faith helps us to be free of that fear, knowing that Jesus has brought us to salvation and redemption. Those of us gathered here, of course, and, and, and the others, believers. But when somebody doesn't die in peace, what, is, what does that say about why are they not dying in peace? But was it about their family? What did they learn? I would find it to be a very difficult thing to talk about or to imagine that a person, a person who is unbelieving, unbelieving, unrepentant, unbelieving mostly, how do they die? What is their experience like? We can't imagine that because we have faith. We have no feeling for that. But we have a thinking about that, that there are people who, who don't die in peace. Okay? I think we're going to have to quit there. It's five of.